I didn't really realize how perfectionism got in my way until I got until the last few years of my life. <laughs> and, and not to say it's too late. I'm just saying that to those of you out there who um, who, who think you have to be um, what they want. And that's a slippery slope because you don't know what they want. And sometimes they don't know what they want. So the best thing that any student of acting or performing arts or anything can do is simply begin and then keep going no matter what. Welcome to Film Forums. My name is Aisha Shbeli and I have with me a very special guest, Vincent Rodriguez III. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Vincent? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm an actor based out of Los Angeles. I'm originally from San Francisco, and I started in the business focusing on theater, um, specifically musicals. I graduated from the Pacific Conservatory of Performing Arts in Santa Maria, California, just three and a half hours north of Los Angeles. And uh, after booking the first national tour of 42nd Street right out of college in 2003, I found myself touring the country for nine months, moving to New York, auditioning for Broadway and national tours, and booking um, the original cast of Irving Berlin's White Christmas, which led to a few years of doing regional theater, and then uh, transitioning into off-Broadway and playing lead role, uh, more leading men type roles, and auditioning in New York, doing more national tours, uh, spending more years in New York, uh, training at the, uh, yeah, Actors Connection and taking seminars with various casting directors and taking class at Broadway Dance Center and Steps NYC uh, until I found myself doing Here Lies Love at the Public Theater um, with Tony Award winner Ruthie Ann Miles as Imelda Marcos. And I got to play opposite her because I understood he Conrad Wicamora from How to Get Away with Murder. And um, it was during that time I booked the role of Josh Chang on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and as, after they, I booked the part, um, they made the character Filipino, which is reflective of my heritage. And a few months into this, uh, it being released, we found out that uh, I was the first Filipino romantic male lead on network television. And a few months later, um, the episode where you meet Josh Chan's family, uh, we realized that was the first time a Filipino family had ever been depicted on network television. So Crazy Ex-Girlfriend opened up a lot of doors for me. And um, as a enthusiastic uh, advocate of performing arts, live theater, singing, dancing, acting, and um, all the various things that I geek out about, um, I've also been a very uh, enthusiastic, uh, headstrong teacher um, all those years after graduating from PCPA in 2003. Um, I just took a little bit of a break from that the last two years because of the pandemic just trying to get myself get myself sorted out and uh now i'm working and working on voiceover projects uh waiting for a second season announcement for a show i'm doing on amazon prime video with love which is being released in france brazil and many other countries this february 11th and every episode's a different holiday so it's perfect timing for valentine's day because we have a valentine's day episode but uh that is a long and the short of who I am, where I came from, um, what my background is, and where I'm at now. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that. And it's it's so nice to to see that progression, you know, and especially when we when we're talking about theater and things, it's something that we don't always get into enough on the show, actually, is how mm. important musical theater is, you know, and and how much of a love and passion it is for us as well, you know, even those of us who ultimately want to be in film and, and television, it's good to have that really strong theatre background and have that really good solid training, I think. And you're one of those people that, you know, you're a triple threat, as they would call it. You can, you do everything. Um, but I think with Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, the amazing thing about that show, obviously, is, you know, like you said, it, it depicted something that hadn't been seen before. But isn't it kind of crazy that it hadn't? Like that, you know, it's quite... It's amazing that you were the first, but it's also disappointing that it took that long. You Indeed. know, Indeed. that's my. Um, but one thing about that show is that it broke so many barriers. It brought musical theater to television as well, which I don't think had really been done in that way before either. No, I hadn't. Yeah, it was an absolutely amazing show. I was addicted. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. 
it. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, you know, um, your experience in theatre school? So like the audition process and just the overall experience of being in theatre school, what do you think that you got out of it and what do you think could maybe be done better? What advice would you give to someone going to theatre school? Well, one, I think it's a great idea to go to theater school. If you want to be good at something and you want it to be a part of your life in a way that you can draw hot happiness and or income from, um, and I say that very specifically. So if you need to rewind that, go back. <laughs> you can have both or you can just pick one. <laughs> um, I've seen both scenarios play out but um you know i really loved acting and i really wanted to do musical theater because that was my joy my joy brought me joy uh and uh, i had a very um visceral connection to musical theater because it's heightened it is not real life it's what real life can't be and what we wish it could be during those moments where we're so sad, we have to sing. We're so happy, we have to dance. We're so moved and in love that we, we have to sing and dance, you know? Um, and through that, through the chasing of that dream and that hope of doing musical theater in, 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 in the best of the best of places, Broadway, the West End, you know, I chased after that dream in school and in New York for 11 years. And throughout all of it, I think there was a few things that came up that were my strength and also my weakness. And that was trying to be perfect. This is a bit of a personal subject for me because uh, I got where I am in my career by being overly criticized by my parents and feeling like I had to please them. And meeting casting directors, auditioning for schools like PCPA, um, the only school I auditioned for because <laughs> I couldn't afford any other school, right? So you do what you can until you do what you need to do until you can do what you want to do. A little sound bite for you there to help you. Um, and that goes with school and that goes with survival jobs when you're trying to book bigger jobs you know when you're non-union trying to get your equity card or your union but you're trying to get more work or you have a lot of work but it's not the work you want or you know anytime that happens you just say well what can i be doing until i you know what, what can i do now until i can do what i really want to do and what can i do now that would help the future the future me and so um I didn't really realize how perfectionism got in my way until I got until the last few years of my life. <laughs> and, and not to say it's too late. I'm just saying that to those of you out there who, um, who, who think you have to be um, what they want. And that's a slippery slope because you don't know what they want. And sometimes they don't know what they want. So the best thing that any student of acting or performing arts or anything can do is simply begin and then keep going no matter what. And if any of you are like reading books, uh, you can get the books uh, by Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, called Infinite Game. And he talks about different, two different mindsets, being a finite player where you're running in a race of life or of business or of theater, and you're looking to your left and to your right and who's ahead of you and who's behind you. Well, guess what? That takes a lot of energy from your neck. Aren't you running a race? Shouldn't you be focusing on pacing yourself, your breath, your focus, picturing yourself in the finish line, leaning forward, all these things, just like an actor does before they prepare to go on stage, right? Shouldn't I be focusing on those things that I'm going to be, that, that, that are important? Yes. So wasting your energy and time to look behind you left, right, not going to serve you. But if you want to have a career and you want it to last, and you want it to be fulfilling, you want to have kids, you want to have a house, and you want, you want longevity, you want residual income, you want fulfillment, you want artistry, you want 
mastery. You want creativity. You want collaboration. You want a tribe of people to fulfill your theatrical loves and desires, your voiceover loves and desires, your, your musical theater dreams and hopes, your TV and film jobs and goals. Mm -hmm. Then the goal is to stay in the game just to play the game. It doesn't matter who's ahead of you, who's behind you, how far you are along. That doesn't matter because that always changes. Mm -hmm. But creating a mindset, the mind feeds the body, right? This is where things start. Once we start there and then, and then you have a, not necessarily a game plan, but you are aware that you're aware and that what you pay attention to and what you focus on is what expands and is ultimately what you will all, always think about. So if you're one of those people who lives in self-doubt and you live in, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm too freaked out. Then that's all you're going to get. And you will never progress, unfortunately. But if you can seduce yourself into just doing what you love getting in those reps, you know, like at the gym, we got to get a few more reps in, you know, um, drop the weight. We'll just do a few more reps. Oh, it's so heavy. Oh, I'll drop the weight. We just got to get a few more reps. You just got to be that character for five more minutes. We just got to interview that character. We just need to, you know, go through the kinesthetic response of the character. We got to go through their dynamics. We got to go through what they want, what they need. What are the themes of the story? How do they feed in with the character? And how does that character serve a purpose within the scene, within the story, beginning, middle, end, all these things. If that's what you're thinking about, and that's what brings you joy, then you never have to worry about being without, and you never have to worry if you can or cannot do your job. Because whether you're a voiceover artist, on camera, in films, or on stage, doing plays or musicals, the process is the same. Becoming a different person and utilizing your real life time to put in the reps and practice the focus and attention that is necessary in order to do those things. And that's what I've been focusing on in the last two to four years of my career and have, I feel like I have a new career. And so that's the gift I give to the artists who are looking at schools or looking at going from school to finding an agent or a manager, you know, focus on whatever the next right move is. And just know that is determined on why you're doing this, what you want to do specifically and who you identify yourself to be all those things will come into big play once you're in the world of artistry and you're lost and you don't no one's hiring you or no one's seeing your work or you feel weird posting things on instagram yeah it's really weird it's weird but part of the reason why it's weird is because people don't know what they're actually supposed to be doing so i give if you ever forget you can just use this little reminder i i use it every day be do share have do who you want to be Mm -hmm. do it do the things that person does the version future version of you and this can be applied to scenes too so be the character do the things the character does be do share share that with your colleagues share that on on camera share it with your you know your the people who you trust your fellow collaborators be do share and now you have that you have that experience because you put in the time. It took me three hours to prepare two pages of sides. Great. Guess what? The next time you do that, it's going to take you a shorter amount of time because you're so, you're so used to the process. First thing you get a script, first thing you get sides, the process itself can just click if you repeat it over and over and over again. So to the point where it's not work anymore. You're simply in flow. The flow state, which is a science, an actual scientific state of, of thinking when whether you're cruising a 300 foot wave, doing a 300 foot canoe drop off the off a cliff or, um, you know, juggling knives, <coughs> spinning fire or um, playing a series regular on, on a TV show or being a superhero in a in a big, big budget feature film. You know, um, uh, if, if you can't focus your attention and your energy into that character or into that moment or into what the director is saying or into the costume or how you feel in it or how you look in it or how you're connected to that actress who's bringing so much life to the character opposite you. If you can't just focus on that thing and you let yourself be distracted or seduced by these things that don't matter or that are not there to serve you or that things that just bother you and don't serve you, 
then you're not going to really get to the to the to the maximum your full potential potential and what's beautiful about that potential is that it it is it is infinite it is something we as human beings continue to explore uh, we see it in basketball players trying to be taller a lot longer games runners how fast can we run the mile you guys the four, the minute the four minute mile was was impossible it was impossible look it up on google go google that four minute mile it was impossible you couldn't do it you couldn't do it it was no human could do it in less than four minutes otherwise you'd die that's what we thought and no one did it until someone did it and then three months later a high school kid did it and beat that record. And all of a sudden, all these other people started to do it. So what does that mean? It means this is going to be your limitation. So if you want to be on TV and film, go do it. But do not be seduced by all the impediments that are going to come in front of you. There will always be challenges. And life is not perfect. Life is beautiful. And life is beautiful. No, wait. Life is messy. <laughs> People and everyone are beautiful. That's I'm misquoting my friend Desmond Chum, who's on With Love With Me. And he was in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And he's an amazing Australian actor. And he said that to me one day. He was like, life is messy and everyone is beautiful. That's my summation for this journey as an artist and in this business. Because ultimately what people want is security and you won't get it. But if you want security of your own peace of mind, your own happiness and your own artistic um, fulfillment, then the way to guarantee that for yourself is to not do it for them. Do it as an act of service. Take whatever your gifts are, get them at the, at the level that, that is just, that is at the level that is compatible in the business, but also at the level of like where you know your voice so well, you know your process as, a, as an actor so well, you know your process as a dancer, a martial artist, a singer. These are all things that I do. And so I have a warm up when I do, when, before I sing, I have a warm up before I do voiceover. I have things I need to have in place before I go to set. Um, I have a process of working on a play or a musical based on all my time understudying in college and in my in business. So I had a, I've had a lot of experience just sitting there and taking notes and observing, which is a tool because your observation is your focus. But a lot of us take it for granted. Um, we don't eat enough. We don't get enough sleep. We don't drink enough water. We pay attention to things that don't really help us get better. We just and like uh, criticism, whether it's other people's criticism, your parents' criticism, your criticism, your spouse's criticism. And it's little things, little microaggressions that at the end of your day stack up. And now you have this huge brick of, of judgment on you. Mm -hmm. How are you supposed to do your work? You can't move. You're paralyzed. So that's what I had. And I, the wish I have for others for other artists, uh, whether you're in front of the camera, behind the camera, on stage, off stage, backstage, um, you're in the publicity office, you're in marketing, you're at the box office, you're producing the show. Um, you know, I think there needs to be a sense of collaboration, compassion, creativity, and um, that we can celebrate as long as we champion one another and champion one another's ideas and and enjoy the energy that exists when you find like-minded people and you, you, you have a leader or multiple leaders who can help inspire one another to just create this cool, unique, different thing that is what it is because of the collaboration. And yeah. the best examples of that are Crazy Ex-Girlfriend for me with love, which we're still waiting to hear about a season two. So fingers crossed. <laughs> um, and uh, I did, a, I, you know, I, I, I just got an Academy Award nomination, Raya and the Last Dragon, which I got to be a part of the loop group, ADR group, like 12 actors in a big screen with different mics in front of them, just doing all the sound for the movie that isn't the principles. So I got to play all these different characters. I had to run away from a monster and all these things and say these words that I never planned on saying. And I did it through just looking at the cartoon and being a human being and going, I know what that feels like, or I know what that situation is. Now I'm going to be that person and I'm going to feel that. And then whatever comes out, comes out. 
no absolutely. planning, just living, you know? And yeah. I have the acting center to thank for that. That is, that is my training school at the moment. And uh, it's, it's been pretty great to be a school that doesn't give me their opinion. They really empower me as the artist to know what my job is. And they give me the tools and the drills so that I can do that job, which is in service to the people who are casting me, who are who, who need a guy to play this person or to sing the song or da, 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 da. And, um, and, and, and that's kind of the way I look at my career is that I, I have to just maintain myself and my skills so that I can be of service to these stories that people keep writing. And so I just keep learning and growing so that I can play in the game and never stop playing. Stay sharp. Definitely. Amazing. Yeah. Well, stay sharp. And, and but you know what? If you're not sharp, don't carry shame for that because that's also BS and a waste of time. Because the, theater, other people's, it, we think theater exists for other people's opinion. It does not. It exists to deliver messages and to empower and create an impact. And that's why we love theater. But there's a business side to theater that a lot of us actors are, don't handle very well. So if you look at some of the most successful actors who are, you know, maybe seemingly meek or, or low energy or just slower, not as excited or just very reserved, even though their characters are not, that might be because they're really good at being other people. But when they're themselves, they don't want to deal with all that stuff because they just like being these characters and being in a collaborative environment. The other side to that is the business side. And that's the side that you some of that stuff you can't learn in class. You learn through experience. You learn through having mentors, being in the room where it happens, Hamilton quote. Um, and that's by being around like-minded people and being around people who are where you want to be and being willing to be a student and to learn and grow and have humility and compassion. Because if you don't, then you're going to be at the top and you're going to be looking down and then that's going to be false you're going to fall you'll fall very hard um because the, there's other people who you're working with who got a break and they're not as with it as you are or maybe they know more than you you know there's always someone better someone smarter someone you know mm -hmm. and uh so if you can learn how to have humility and compassion and be a team player and know that your part is important and only you can do what you do with that part. And if you don't, none of us will have it. It will be lost. Wouldn't it be great if you had a technique or a lifestyle that empowered you to be that kind of artist, no matter what time of day, where you are, or what circumstance you're in? Wouldn't it be great? Absolutely. <laughs> it would be great. It, well, guess what? It's 100% it's, it's possible. It just takes a lot of facing your fears and a lot of self-exploration, which is no different than any master's program that you would pay how much money for? Uh, a lot of money. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it's different in the U.S. Like, to hear. Either way, yeah. it's a lot more. I yeah, would not <laughs> yeah it's like it's like what path do you choose? Who do I follow? And, and where do I go? And what do I do? And people are so focused on what do I do? And it's just like, well, what do you want? And how does what you want, how does what you want have anything to do with the world and the world you live in and the world that you don't live in? I think those are important questions to ask. Uh, and if they don't get explored, I think you run the risk of uh, falling into uh, the other mindset of being a finite player. And, and if you don't know you are a finite player and you think you're an infinite player, I'm in the game and I'm keeping it going and, you know, but you're not in class, you're not taking care of your voice, your skin, your hair, your relationships. So you don't postcard anyone, you don't text anyone, you don't send emails, you're not trying to meet new artists, you're not reaching out to the artists you already worked with. People are like, I don't have a career. And I'm like, well, who have you emailed? What are you creating? Who, who's in your tribe? Who do you create with? What's your training regimen? Because the answer to all those questions can be different, but just recognize that the people you want to work with have answers to those questions. So if you don't, then you don't have the reps. You don't have the experience. And that's not necessarily dependent upon I can get the job, join an acting class, meet some actors. Oh, I get along with this one, this one. Great. 
Go meet them for coffee. Cool. Bring a play with you. I read it for fun. Find a three-page scene from a movie or TV show. Or one of them is a writer. Ask them to write something. You read it. Talk about it. It costs nothing. It absolutely doesn't. And the thing is, as well now, I think it's even more accessible. And although, obviously, the the lockdowns and the pandemic and things, obviously, there's been a lot of negative impact. But there has also been, for me personally, one positive thing that's come out of it is that doing this, doing film forums, presenting for film forums, I've gotten to meet so many people. And I've also attended networking events and film festivals now virtually. And I've gotten to meet so many film professionals I never would have gotten to meet before. Um, So I guess being holed up in my house has actually been kind of good for me as well, in in a sense, socially, because I'm socialising with people globally, you know, and I live in a small city. So I would never have met any of you. You know what I mean? So, you know. Hey, can we celebrate that for a second? Can we just, (laughs) can we, can we like throw it up? Just like, go ahead, applaud. I want to see it. I want to see you applaud. Applaud. Oh. <laughs> yes. Give me a high five. I want that uh, high five through the zoom. Yes. I want to see it. I want to see it. High five. And if you're watching this, feel free to high five her or me or just high five yourself <laughs> in the mirror. Um, Cause that's something else that I've been doing and, and good for you. Like, like that's what you just said is something that takes a lot of bravery and it's what people are still dealing with now, depending or, you know, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I think that's an important aspect to recognize because it, it's affecting um, the kind of work and stories that are being written and, and done right now in Hollywood and all over the world, you know? Um, and I think, I think the important takeaway from what you just said is there, there is always, I'm not going to say there's always a bright side, but I will say there was always something to learn from any situation. And if you are patient enough to allow your, emotions to to slowly fizzle and change because anyone in in a heightened emotional state like a traumatic state anxiety stress depression um you know um loneliness uh anger um you know sadness uh you can't you don't have all your agency you don't have your all your assets you know mentally it's in fact it's a different side of the brain i think um but don't quote me on that and so but when when those emotions go away what you're left with is like just you. And I did a lot of awareness exercises, uh, reading The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer, doing the 21 day Deepak Chopra meditation journey. Um, you know, Oprah, I'm like, thank you, Oprah. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, and, uh, you know, listening to speakers like Joe, D- Joe Dispenza and Michael Beckwith and Wayne Dyer and um, Brene Brown, Simon Sinek, Jim Quick. Um, these are, these are thought leaders and authors whose business it is to either inspire, educate, inform, and ultimately help those who need help helping themselves and who need help helping others. All those people whose names I just said have that in their DNA, in their why. And your why is what will fuel anything you do for the rest of your life. So if that why is family, you know, some people are like, I don't care what job it is. I got kids. I got to make money because so I'll do the shitty job here. I'll do the great job there. I'll do that shitty job there. I'll do this one for the money. This one for the money, 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 Mm -hmm. money goes up. Art, morale maybe goes down because it's all about money. That's the focus. But when it becomes about art, it's not about money and you have residual income. So income's still high, but then like you're doing things you love. And so your cup is filled, but you're still making money because you love theater, but you know, TV, film and commercials help pay bills and help create residual income so that you don't have to take jobs. You can actually do what you want to do or which is what's happening now. It's happening literally right now. People are just creating their own content on Instagram yeah. and TikTok. That's what TikTok is. People can take a video from like they, they do. They, they filmed that six months ago and they can make it into a TikTok and post it and get like 30,000 views on it. And that can be monetized. And so there's also that blurred line for actors, which is also confusing and distracting. So I actually took a lot of time away from social, um, social media during the pandemic because I had to, I knew something, I, I felt something was off, something was wrong with me. And mm-hmm. it wasn't that there was anything wrong with me. It's that I was processing so much 
And I had, I was just in shock, you know? Um, and so I gave myself permission to not be okay. So that helped. I got sleep. I nourished. I exercised all things. Um, exercise, sleep, and hydration are extremely important. And um, so if any of you are like, how do I maintain my body while I'm pursuing my career? Uh, get enough sleep, make sure you drink water, and make sure you eat nutritious food. Because guess what? It all shows up on your face. <laughs> it all shows up on your face. And, you know, every TV film audition, boom, this is your frame. I don't know if you noticed, but I have framed myself like I'm either on like. Self yeah, it's like I didn't. Yeah, I frame for the industry that I'm in so I can do the interview one be in the center. But like, really, like sometimes auditions are like you're, you're shooting, you're, you're shooting it there. Yeah. So like, you know, and and so so it's one of those things where people think, oh, I have this audition. I have to scrounge myself and get myself together. It's like, yeah, that's going to happen. But let's just say like you already have a regiment where you go to the gym almost every day and you do your hair and you blow dry it and you put on your face, which is all the things that you do for your face. You brush your teeth, you know, you, you know, your body, you do your stretches at the gym, you do certain things and then you're tired and you eat and you have an apple and then you drink your tea and your water. And then you read a book outside you reset and then you pivot to something else. Well, what I just described is kind of my morning, but what I also just described to you is that, is the ability to, to create a routine that actually is there for you and helps sustain you, whether you're working or not. Mm -hmm. That yeah. could be my routine on set. It actually is. I was on set a few weeks ago. Can't tell you about that job. I don't think, <laughs> but um, uh, it'll air in the next two months. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, um, you know, how you do anything is how you do everything. So if you're going into a school, like, remember that that school is there for you to try new things and fail and to learn how to get out of your own way. And the best way to get out of your own way is just let go of criticism, self or otherwise. And that means letting go of criticism of other students in your class. As soon as you start, stop paying attention to criticizing people and you're able to just objectively look at stories and be like, oh, that's, that's a cool story. That's a cool monologue. That's a cool scene. Oh, it didn't turn out the way I thought it would based on what I know about it, or I didn't quite get this from it. And now it's not about the actors. It's just about the art you just saw. And having that ability to compartmentalize and just be able to zoom out a little bit and have compassion for the actress performing, you're going to have compassion for yourself as you continue to pursue and grow and build your career and your skill set, because all your skills can be developed. And if you don't have a skill, you can always start. And then just never stop training little bit by little bit every day, brick, brick by brick. That's Mel Robbins, who is another <laughs> author you should check out, who also wrote The High Five Habit. Because this is not just me, guys. I'm not, I'm not like, I wrote all these books. No, 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 no. I'm a human being. I, I just knew what I just knew who, what I wanted, why I'm doing it, and why it's important, and what impact I want to make. And that is what has fueled my actions, which is actually how habits and, and willpower and discipline work. And it's fueled by love. When you read these things and, and experience them as well, I think that's obviously what resonates with you. And that's why you're, you know, you remember it as something that you kind of hold with yourself, like, oh, that makes total sense. And you you can use it to remind yourself sometimes, I think, when you're struggling as well. So I think it's good to have a sort of um like a kit of of quote of quotes or, or affirmations or whatever that kind of help you to redirect sometimes when you need it. But I wanted to ask you about with love. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about the importance with Crazy Ex-Girlfriend breaking down a lot of barriers, talking about things like mental health in a way that was never spoken, you know, it was never done before in that way, especially in comedy. Tell us about with love, what barriers are you breaking with that? And why did you want to tell that story specifically? Well, with love was written by Gloria Calderon Kellett, who wrote One Day at a Time, a remake on Netflix. And Gloria is one of the is one of our leaders in, in, in Latina and Latin X representation right now on television. And she is, I mean, it feels kind of like a movement at the moment because how she's folding in so many other marginalized groups. And she did that with this show, which actually came out of her experience in the pandemic. Because she, just like 
the rest of us, woke up many days and turned on, opened an app, a social media app, and found nothing but pain and suffering and um, just was triggered by trauma. She, yeah. she didn't see love. She didn't see joy. She didn't see family, which is all the things that we were all missing and lacking during this time. Um, so she wrote with love and it's diverse Latino, Latin X, Mexicano, Cuban, a Filipino, Chinese, black. Um, you hear Spanish talked by both, uh, 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 Latins and Latinx and, and black people and my character, uh, Henry, who, who is Filipino, um, they wanted him to be fluent in Spanish. I, I am not fluent in Spanish. So I said no to that audition. And then Gloria was like, but I want I want Vinny to audition. This is before she knew me as Vinny. She's like, I want Vinny to audition. He doesn't have to speak message. I'm like, okay, I'll audition. And, um, and I read the script and I just thought it was a beautiful story. And I thought it, these characters do exist in real life. I've met them, I've seen them, but I've never seen them on TV before. And I've never seen a story that focuses on purely love, joy, and family yeah. of all these marginalized groups. Yeah, the stories that are never told. Like, yeah, haven't been told. We never, in the same episode, you see a couple in their 40s, in their 50s, struggling, mm -hmm. married, and then a couple in their 70s having also similar struggles, but, and both couples have sex, have a sex life, and that gets explored and is focused on. And you have the 20-somethings and the 30-somethings, and, you know, that guy's white, that person's non-binary, um, that person's queer, that person's gay. Like it's every age, nationality, and and um, you know identity, uh, sexual, um, and you know LGBTQIA identity or non-binary. You know, like we have a lot of representation on the show, and hashtag representation matters. People need to see themselves seen on camera and that's what me, drew me to with love and and that's honestly what is kind of fused the energy that we're all feeling in fact i just got a text message from gloria and the whole cast because february 11th it, it launches in in all these other countries and france and brazil and all these other places so we're really excited yeah i mean i think that that's amazing especially to have so much representation and and in a way that's authentic not like a tick box exercise do you know what i mean like yeah. i think it's so important to tell those stories. I myself am an ethnic minority as well, I'm mixed race. And um, I remember not that long ago, the first time that I'd seen someone on TV who looked like me was uh, Mr. Robot. And that's uh, Rami Malek, obviously. So he's Egyptian, I'm North African as well. Yeah. And I actually felt like a little bit emotional because it was the first time I'd seen someone in a lead role where it didn't really matter what ethnicity was. He was, you know, he was, playing a fantastic character with so much depth and people don't realize how important that is for people of ethnic minorities so to hear you know your story of, of your show how much that's going to resonate with so many different types of people is just amazing like yeah I, impact wonderful and yeah we need that's more. what we need exactly we need more more the people want more but ultimately like as artists um, the goal isn't to be as good as whoever you idolize or who, um, or, you know, get the applause or the, or the awards. Cause there's a lot of actors out there who, who are fulfilled and live happy lives and have great careers and who have never won a single award. You know, it's, it's really about you being in touch with your creativity and, and, and whatever your artistry is, whether you're a painter, uh, a graphic designer, you know, um, you work in marketing, or you, um, you know, you like to design sets or lighting plots, or, you know, you like to choreograph, you like to direct, you like tumbling or gymnastics, or I don't know, baton twirling. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters is that you have gifts, you have skills that come naturally to you, and you have interests that create excitement in you, meaning you don't need a Red Bull because whenever I play the song, you want to dance. Or whenever I say these few words from Shakespeare, you just want to read it yourself. You want to get up and say it. Like whenever I say, you know, romantic comedy, you're like, oh my God, I want to, I want to be in charge of where the story is and like how it's seen and what it looks like. It's like, that's what a director does. You know, so you know, like, like pay attention to what, 
creates that energy in you. And, and remember, back to your point, is that whatever you do has an impact. When you be that thing, when you be your idea, when you be that kind of artist, when you be that version of yourself, and you do those things that that person does, you share that with your family, your friends, your colleagues, your tribe, your various communities, the, the people you collaborate with. When you, after you share that, you have that. No one can take that away from you. I have, I have, I have posters and magazine articles around me in frames, not because I need to pump up myself or like everyone look how cool I am. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with ego. It has everything to do with reminding ourselves that we can do this in a world that has a lot of distraction and a lot of seductive things that try to get you off your game or to try to create resistance or trepidation in you. Because when you can instill fear in others, you can kind of control them. Um, but us as artists, we have an ability to just create love and excitement and enthusiasm, even if it's a story that's grotesque or about pain, because the people who the actors who are there on set, they just want to get to the story. They want to get to the message. They want to get to the meaning. They want to get to like, oh, the story is so important or oh, the story is so amazing and asks all these questions about the human condition or wow, this is such a beautiful way of looking at this classic story like there's always an enthusiasm and a love there for the story that's being told. And if you can, re if you can rehearse that in all the things you create and all the glimmers of light that all the ideas that come to you and you're grabbing them like stars, like you just spun out and you're like, well, I'm dizzy. You see stars. And those are, but those are ideas, your ideas, grab them. Cause if you don't grab them in a few years, you'll realize someone else grabbed them. You know, so like, like being, being an artist is, is kind of a responsibility. And if you've ever read the letter, is it the letter to Agnes DeMille or Martha Graham or mm -hmm. vice versa? Essentially the synopsis is like, is, is that no artist is ever satisfied. We are continuously unsatisfied and we have this little, little impulse inside us to continue to march to the beat of our own drum, no matter how lonely it is or how odd it may seem. But, but we, that dissatisfaction in us for what we could do keeps us reaching forward and even more curious and even more um, um, inquisitive about what can be explored in whatever it is that you're creating, whether you're working on a play, musical, or, or, or choreography, or what have you. And if you just have that curiosity, and you repl and you have that take over this space of judgment, curiosity over judgment, which I believe is a white Walt Whitman quote, quote, be curious, not judgmental. You create a whole space. You you that's like Albert Einstein space, because he was just he just let his ideas fly, and, he, and everyone thought he was crazy many times in his life but it didn't matter to him because he recognized something that many people don't and if you let go of like what other people think and you give yourself the freedom to be in touch with your own creativity your own ideas you are unstoppable because no one else in the world just like your thumbprint is like you and has your thoughts your relationship to to the world to various spaces and what you do with that character, no one else can do. No one. Which is why if you do it and you build it, it'll be great. Whether or not it fits in with that show you're auditioning for, that's not up to you. Your job is to create things that resonate with you. That's it. And if they hire you, great. That's a byproduct of doing the work. That's what they mean by doing the work. Do the work. I just did the work. I'm, work I'm doing the work right now. After this, I'm about to go do a voiceover. Oh, wow. And I'm just going to, I am just I did the work. And I already have notes for myself. I'm like, oh, yeah, I could have punched in and he could have been, you know, the character is this and this and not all these ideas. But it's like, but, I, but I'm not there now. Like, I'm done. I already, I already read it. This is just editing. And so instead of beating myself up about it, I just recognize, oh, there was more possibility there. Oh, that would be fun. Oh, that would be cool. So now I'm using th this moment even though I can't go back on the audition, but I'm using this moment to go, oh, that's a 
like as if that were someone else's audition and I'm just the director going, oh, that would have been a fun idea. Oh, it would have been fun if he pushed that idea or, if he li- or like he asked that question or that would have been funny if he did that. Mm-hmm. Just being creative. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because I'm used to that. And that's what the people who are hiring you need you to do. That's why they pay you a lot of money. I'm not just paying you to bark, sing, be pretty, <laughs> so, so pretty, say these words. The words can change. Mm-hmm. Pages change all the time. Sometimes they might change the character. So, oh yeah, we're doing this scene today, but your character, um, we changed this, your character. And you're like, what's my character now? And then now you, now, now do you know how to change your character? Do you know yeah. how to take, take, their, take their being and change their outlook or change their speed of entering a room or their energy? Can you go from big energy to small energy? Like, can you play with dynamics? Are you even aware of what dynamics are in a scene or kinesthetic response or relationship? So these are all the things that you explore in acting school. And these are all the things you explore in acting on a set. Anyway, they just don't, people don't always use those words because everyone has different backgrounds, different training. And some people actually don't have training or enough training or the same training which means the people who lead have to use different language so that they keep everyone on the same page. So it's, it's a, it's a fascinating journey of of the artist. Just know it'll never be perfect progress over perfection. That way you're unstoppable because because you'll never get to perfect or you might get to perfect. If you do, you're in one in a million and that's great, but it's the pursuing and the progress that matters most because people stop when it's not perfect. They stop when they're afraid. They stop when something goes wrong when it doesn't work out their way, when they feel scared. I have space for that. I get it. I totally get it. Just recognize that confidence is doing something even when you're not sure of the outcome. It's being brave enough to see what happens even when it could be horrible. So ask yourself that what's, what's it worth? What's that worth? If you have some, if you can, every single one of you out there could name five things. And I'm saying five, because I know I definitely have five, five things that you can't control that you wish you could so that you could have the life that you want or five things that you're unwilling to deal with or complain about or say, or conversation you don't want to have emails. You don't want to write whatever things you, you're just avoiding, that you're resisting. Whatever you write down in that list will continue to persist for the rest of your life until you take care of it. And at some point, you will have a wonderful opportunity and you won't be able to fully enjoy it or take grasp of it because there's something in your way that you've chosen not to address. When if you did address it, it would have caused a whole lot of trauma. You'd be sad, mad, angry, frustrated, your brain is a pharmacy, so your brain would shoot all these chemicals into your body and you'd feel feelings, emotions, right? Those are temporary. I could cry right now and it would be over. And I'd go back to be, and I didn't even say feeling sad. I just said I could cry right now if I wanted to because crying is not specific or exclusive to being sad. You can cry from happiness. But I'm saying yeah. I can cry right now if I wanted to, because it's my job. Why, why am I crying? Ba, 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 ba. That's my job. Yeah, why am I crying? What just happened? Where did I go? Yeah. What, who am I talking to? Where am I at now? Like, where am I going? Like, what's going to happen to me? What was my day like? Like, <laughs> these are all, a, a character asks those questions and then things happen. Their emotions change, you know? So same thing with us as human beings, like your emotions will change. So don't like make decisions based on your emotions because <laughs> they change, but your wants, your desires, your, your purpose, your why, those things don't typically change. Simon Sinek actually says you have one why. And when you find out what it is, you can do anything. And so I'm living that right now. And this is a part of my why is is helping others and being in service and using my skills to lift others up and inspire them so they can be inspired and create whatever they want because whatever they create is whatever our future is. 
you know yeah and, and that's why we do this show you know is to have people like yourself who are like-minded that really want to share your knowledge and share your experience and we really do appreciate you coming on the show honestly it means so much to the audience also me personally because well I spent years watching you on tv absolutely loving you so yeah it's been absolutely wonderful to have you on the show if you could give like one tiny piece of advice I think I know what it's going to be but what would it be what's your little golden snippet oh my golden snippet is the same every time I actually tell people this all the time and I tell them it's my golden snippet risk failure at the possibility of success Thank you so much. Beautiful.